Awesome, Chris. Well, thank you for taking the time and joining me today. Very excited to talk about a topic that I'm super interested in is, you know, blockchain and also sustainability and, you know, getting businesses to be more transparent for for consumers or for businesses or governments in general. Uh, I think blockchain provides the opportunity for a lot of different things to be implemented in this supply chain of sort of, you know, business for good as we as we move toward this revolution and in business being sort of a really positive force for you know, not only humanity and the environment, um, but everything that it that touches and affects. So before we get into Topple and, and everything that you have built, you and the team have built, talk about your journey to to get into even starting Topple, your, your journey into blockchain. Grant, super excited to, uh, to be joining you today. My journey into the blockchain, into the Web3 space started, started about 10 years ago. I was back at university started falling down this rabbit hole 20, 2012, 2013. I had some friends that were into Bitcoin. You know, they were doing a bit of mining. They were doing a bit of trading. They introduced me to, to the space. I got interested, got a little bit of Bitcoin. But the first project that I, you know, remember really getting involved in, really getting interested by was Ripple. So mm -hmm. Ripple back then was actually running, and I, I loved the program. I loved the idea. They were running this virtual airdrop that, you know, I think really hooked me in. It was one of the things that I was studying at university was computational physics. I was doing a lot of work in that area. And what Ripple had done is they had partnered with a number of the the open source computing projects like Folding at Home or SETI at Home or there were some projects out of Berkeley where we could donate like compute time, like your, you know, your laptop's mm, just sitting yeah. around not doing anything and you could help contribute to these big scientific problems. And what Ripple had done is they had partnered with these with these groups and they said, if you contribute compute time to these, we'll, you know, we'll airdrop you XRP. So it was kind of like, you know, their take on their take on mining, so to speak. So that was one of the first projects that that I got interested in started following Stellar when that spun off a of Ripple. And that was kind of my first exposure to, you know, the intersection of Web3 and financial inclusion or the intersection of Web3 and global development. Uh, so, you know, I just spent a couple of years as a hobbyist back in those, you know, back in those early days. But then I started my first crypto company back in 2015, actually, much more on the on the fintech side of things. We were doing mobile payments and like a customer loyalty, a customer engagement application for local businesses, food trucks, coffee shops, yep. nice. things of that nature. So that was my that was my first, you know, exposure with both entrepreneurship and, you know, and Web3 entrepreneurship, but but eventually out of all that uh, was born Topple. Well, let's talk about Topple for a little bit. You know, when, when somebody asks you that's maybe not in the blockchain Web3 space, you know, every day, how do you explain Topple to them? So the way that we usually try to explain Topple is we really think of, want to think about Topple and we want to put Topple out there, you know, as an infrastructure, as this enabling technology. And the parallel that sometimes we'll draw is, you know, if retail and, you know, the traditional economy, the way that we think, talk about and think about things now, you know, if we say that that runs on Visa or that runs on MasterCard as, right. like, you, know, ra you know, railways or anything like that, we want Topple to be those same sort of you know railways and everything but for the impact economy we want to be this enabling infrastructure for any of the groups that are working in ethical supply chains or working in refi we want to give them the tools give them the underlying technology to make their vision a reality so when we talk about use cases i think you know i i learn really really well when it comes to like use cases and like parallels. So let's take maybe a use case, maybe like coffee or yeah. you know, jewelry or even, you know, food that have these sort of supply chains and maybe they're, they're a little bit too scattered and, and, you know, they have a lot of different points within, within people touching them along the route to, to get to the end consumer top. Like what does Topple provide them? Like what does the infrastructure actually do? Yeah, absolutely. So before anything else, the one thing I will say about, about use cases, and I'm, you know, I'm guessing there are going to be other people, other founders, other people working on Web3 projects that can probably relate to this point. But one of the things that we've often struggled with is getting confused for our use cases. So, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the work that we've done in coffee, the work we've done in diamonds, the work we're doing in, in the carbon space. And 
when we talk about use cases, it often gets <laughs> lost the fact that, you know, we're not actually the ones moving the diamonds or we're not right. actually the right. ones that are issuing the carbon credits. And that's always, you know, I think it's an interesting line to walk for a lot of us in the blockchain space, in the Web3 space to, you know, to kind of be this hidden technology that other technologists, other platforms are using, but doesn't necessarily have, you know, complete end user exposure so to speak in the in the supply chain use cases maybe to maybe to hit on those first we've done everything from from conflict free diamonds to conflict free precious metals like gold we've done coffee tea chocolate all sustainably and ethically sourced uh you know kind of a lot of these supply chains that have historic and long running problems around labor conditions or around the the prices that say farmers or miners are being paid and mm -hmm. you know really a lot of these supply chains where consumers i think more and more want to be making the right decisions you know they simply just don't have the information to do so and so where topless technology comes into place is topless technology you know us being us being our own blockchain network we are acting maybe as some people could guess we're acting as as a transaction layer or a settlement layer meaning that every necessary record of you know of a fair wage being paid or a farmer signing off that yes i was treated fairly in this transaction or you know data supporting that you know hey this manufacturing plant was being powered with with solar energy all of that data or all of those transaction sign offs are written onto are written onto the top of blockchain and the top of blockchain really acts as you know kind of a digital mirror or a digital twin so as things are you know are moving in the physical world they are moving you know in very much a parallel way along the top of blockchain and so you know if a farmer is meant to be signing off in the physical world that yes this is what i was paid or yes, I was treated fairly or anything like that, you know, they also then are putting that onto the blockchain either themselves or through some facilitating group that that we work with or the farmers work with to just make this easier and more accessible for them. It tries to be sort of a or a ver verifying layer for for supply chains and businesses where don't just take our word for it, right? As a business might, you know, say like here's sort of proof that what we're saying actually we've done or existed throughout our supply chain. Would you say that's a good characterization? I would say it's, a, it's kind of a fine line that we walk on that in, in the sense that we don't do you know, we don't play a role in the verification. We're not the ones checking the documents, checking the data sure. or anything like that. But the organizations that, that use the technology, they are they're using the technology in such a way to improve their verification processes, make their verification processes more transparent or something like that. I'll, I'll give you an example. One of the areas that, that we've done a decent amount of work is around living wages or fair wages in supply chain. And whenever you're talking about, you know, the price that say, say coffee farmers are being paid, that sort of data actually has, you know, has a process or has a characteristic to it that makes it really, really well suited to blockchain based audits. And what do I mean by that? Transactions and just supply chain transactions like anything else are inherently two sided, right? There's the buyer perspective and then there's the seller perspective. And the way that we use blockchain, you know, with the groups that we work with, to increase consumer confidence that, hey, these fair wages, these living wages are actually being paid, is the blockchain is not only recording that transaction once, but in a way it's kind of recording that transaction twice. So a transaction in one of those supply chains will only get included on our chain if both the buyer and the seller are reporting the same price information. And gotcha. so really the idea is, is like obviously buyers have an incentive to overstate the cost pay or the price paid farmers mm -hmm. who, you know on the other side have the incentive to to under report it and so you can you can guess that and you can kind of conclude with a pretty good confidence that if they're reporting the same number well then we know that number is accurate because that's the that's the one thing i that is has been sort of this last mile so to speak for the industry i guess it, it, to scale everything in blockchain or crypto like you need mass sort of a adoption and, and maybe the same at the business level level you need adoption along the supply chain because you need the data input from all sides for the blockchain to even you know really be valuable right or even to, mm -hmm. to work as it as it as it wants to i guess how difficult has it been 
I guess when you talk to businesses, maybe using Topple about getting their entire supply chain <laughs> to get on board with sort of just, you know, simple like generic data input, right? Because that's what it needs to, you know, make these verifications or make the blockchain work as, as you want it to do at, at Topple. No, I mean, you're, you're hitting at a really, <laughs> both an excellent point and, and a really challenging point. The first thing that I'll say on that is dealing with with, with fraud or, or misinformation in the abstract is in a lot of ways much, much harder than dealing with it in reality. Because mm -hmm. if to provide any value, you had to be able to have all data, all participants, right from right from the first implementation. You're absolutely right. You know these these projects would never get off the ground. You'd never be able to provide any incremental value or or, your, or anything like that. But the great thing is is that in you know in kind of in a real world experiences, so to say, fraud is committed in certain key ways, and every supply chain or every marketplace, every ecosystem has certain critical breakpoints that are by far the most important to get right. And if you can't cover the other pieces of it right away, yeah, you want to get to those down the line, but it's not necessarily critical to be able to get at in the first implementation. So for example, in a lot of the supply chain work that we do, the most important transaction is, is that first mile transaction. And everything else, you know, from there is really in a, in a decreasing order of priority. But if we're able to just get that first set of transactions from going from the farmer to the first buyer, going from the mine to the first buyer, that right there is is 90% of it. And so obviously mm -hmm. in further implementations, we wanna say, hey, you know, there's a 12 step supply chain, let's make sure we get all 12 of them to really cover all, all the gaps, all the holes. But if we can get the first one, or if we can get the first one and the last one, you know, a lot of times we're already 90 or 95% of the way there. And, you know, as, as a business trying to take this to market, as a community trying to, to make a difference, you do have to, you know, kind of take advantage and, you know, kind of exploit those those realities to, you know, to get the value out there to start demonstrating key wins and early successes. Are there some things that, that you learned when looking at, like, you know, sectors and industries that maybe at, when you're building it out and you're talking to certain businesses in certain sectors, has something surprised you that like, oh, we could probably use it for this sector a bit like cause sort of fashion, coffee, mm -hmm. like, like you said, there's these traditional supply chains that have been, you know, hindered by maybe human rights violations and sort mm -hmm. of you know, workers' rights. There's a lot of maybe dirty businesses within those supply chains. But now that, you know, technology is sort of, you know, spread across the world in a lot of different ways, are there any sectors that you look at that, oh, that's interesting. I think we can maybe implement this there to make it to make it a lot better. Maybe maybe than not the, the normal ones that we think of. Well, well, in a lot of ways, actually, supply chain, um, the supply chain as a whole kind of had that characteristic for us. So, I mean, I come from an economics background. I was working on the fintech side. Previously, Topple has long-term plans for, for a lot of financial inclusion projects, mm -hmm. you know, launching our own currency and things like that. And, you know, in, in some ways, it's it's critically important, but, you know, maybe supply chain isn't as sexy as, yeah. as other areas of so Web3. <laughs> it's incredibly important. But one of the things that we stumbled upon that really made us make this investment in supply chains early on is in a lot of ways, it gets around the bootstrapping problem that mm, a lot of blockchain yeah. applications have, right? We think about blockchain, we think about Web3, DeFi, NFT marketplaces come to mind. But all of these big use cases that we think about, the things that people get so, so excited about are almost always inherently like, you know, two-sided or, you know, even multi-sided marketplaces. And those are really hard to bootstrap, right? You can't bring in one person into an NFT marketplace. If they're the first user, they're not getting a whole, a whole <laughs> heck of a lot of value. But that's not the case with supply chains, right? I can right. onboard supply chains one at a time, and each supply chain is is getting value. Now, there's definitely additional value, and one of the things that we've started to discover is how we can provide more value to our supply chains when you know when they're starting to operate at scale and actually what's the value that we can provide from one of the other lines of you know business or one of the other verticals that we're going after in the carbon space so for example something that surprised us a lot was the interest in zero carbon 
commodities. So this mm-hmm. idea that mm-hmm. someone would want a, a diamond or jewelry or even a cup of coffee that was zero carbon. And so we were doing a lot of the supply chain work, and then we started having a number of conversations on the carbon side, on the refi side of things. Groups would uh, started coming along, and our blockchain is now being used to issue carbon credits. But one of the things that we discovered, I would say, really only in the past year, is that a decent amount of our supply chain use cases actually represent some buyer demand for the carbon credits being, you know, being issued on another side of the protocol because you can pair, you know, you can pair that that pound of coffee up with a couple of tons of carbon credits. And now that is zero carbon coffee, or you can do that with the diamond, the, the diamonds, the timber, the gold, et cetera, that you're tracing. Mm-hmm. And so that that synergy, I think, was was kind of a cool surprise for us. That's awesome. I want to touch back on the the carbon side of this and the carbon market in, in a second. But one, I want to get a sense of like, what's what's the Topple business model? Like, how does Topple itself make money? Yeah, so, so Topple itself, you know, at our core, we are a, we're a layer zero blockchain. So we are our own blockchain protocol. We are a proof of stake blockchain protocol. And then like a lot of other proof of stake, <laughs> maybe even all proof of stake based blockchains, though there might be a few exceptions, we make money on transaction fees. So Mm -hmm. every time transactions are executed, every time data is written, every time a contract is executed, there's a transaction fee applied to that. And that's really, you know, the core of Topple's economic engine. Though at the same time, we had, you know, we started dabbling fairly early on about having our, really our own product studio. So we would, you know, we would get not only developers and other tech companies coming along, wanting to build their solutions out using our technology, but we also just got a lot of, you know, interest and excitement from the actual commodity traders or the actual brands or the actual farming cooperatives, whatever they may be. And we said, hey, let's come together and actually build, you know, build a product internally that's powered by our technology. And so we started doing some product studio work as well. And, you know, the different products that we have developed or will develop in the future will you know, probably be spun out into, you know, into their own businesses, but those will all run and do all run on, you know, on pretty standard subscription models. Gotcha. I want to touch on that. You mentioned, you know, carbon credits, the carbon marketplace. I mean, it's, it's sort of a, a booming industry and it's trying to figure things out, right? It's, it's very, it's a little bit opaque right now because it's just not these verification tools out there that are, that are great, right? It's, it doesn't seem to be like coffee. It's sort of a, a physical product, right? You could make this much, you can sell this much of this. It's a commodity and carbon credit has a price, but it's not a physical thing, yes. right? And so it's, <laughs> how can, I mean, we can obviously go from the topple uh, point of view, but also just from a block, blockchain in general, as these carbon markets begin to mature, um, there's going to be the eco credit market mm-hmm. and, and water credit. There's going to be these ancillary financial products based on nature, the nature economy is sort of coming. How can we make sure that these things are what they say they are, right? Is is this a problem that blockchain can solve? That's a really positive like use case that everybody can get behind. You know, when, when talking to investors or just kind of talking about Topple, one of the things that always comes up is, is how do we pick the spaces that we're in, right? How do we pick mm-hmm. the things that, totally. that we want to focus on? And, and when we get to carbon, it is really probably one of the areas where I have the easiest answer. Because at least in my experience, there are only two groups or two communities really that talk about or honestly even are familiar with the, you know, the the double spending problem or the double issuance Mm -hmm. problem, right? We talk about it all the time in Web3 because like that was the great innovation of of Bitcoin was solving that double issuance problem without a central authority. And, you know, at the same time, the, the double issuance problem is something that the carbon space is very, very familiar with. You talk to people in the carbon space, you know, they understand the problem of one project that's producing carbon credits, you know, setting itself up on multiple registries, you know, mm-hmm. issuing the same carbon, you know, the same ton of carbon through multiple exchanges, et cetera. So there's like already right at that point that feels like there, you know, feels like there should be this great fit, um, you know, this great problem solution. <laughs> and I think in a lot of ways, it, it is what we've, it is what we've found because in a number of ways, the carbon space is not only very opaque, but it's also fairly, um, 
it's not technically a monopoly because there are technically a, a couple of players in it, but it is a highly, highly concentrated industry. Yep. And whenever you have industries that are highly, highly concentrated, you know, that competitiveness really starts to struggle. And, you know, I think we would both agree that the key area where the carbon space needs to be made to be more competitive is in its its reporting and its transparency in its verification. Yep. So yeah. by first brush, just the simple fact that Web3, and we've seen this with ReFi, can invite new players into the space, can make it easier to, to set up a carbon exchange or to you know, launch an experiment with like a new way of measuring carbon because you know, there's a new chemical process or there's, you know, there's new nature processes that we can run and you can get these, you can get these credits to market more quickly. It creates, you know, creates a marketplace that is more competitive. And generally speaking, I would say if we can make that marketplace more competitive, we're going to, you know, force a greater reckoning of, hey, what do these credits actually mean? Are are people actually able to to look at the underlying data? Are people able to, you know, very easily check across different registries, different exchanges to say, hey, this carbon credit with this ID number actually is the same thing over here. Right. You know, look, it was double issued. Right now, that's really, really challenging to do simply because everything is living in a silo. Everything is highly opaque. And, you know, there's just not much liquidity, transparency, uh, you know, pick the positive market adjective that you want. And <laughs> pretty much that's lacking, at least to some extent, in carbon today. I guess the biggest question is that, is it even possible? Like, will we get to a point where all these things can be solved so that this marketplace, as it it is going to mature, it is maturing already, but there's still, you know, the, the MRV for all this is still lacking. And it's going to be hard, I think, to get it where it needs to go if those things are never, if they're never taken care of, I guess. But, but is it even possible to get to a point where these things are like Bitcoin did for, for the, the double stamping type of thing? Is that even possible to do, you think? I mean, or it just might take another decade. It's so Bitcoin has, you know, when any pure cryptocurrency has the advantage of being, you know, being purely endogenous, right, or purely digital. Bitcoin does not need to care about, does not need to reconcile with data or, you know, information mm -hmm. from the outside world. It lives as its its own perfect little bubble. And whenever you want to get to a use case that does rely on external information feeds, you're going to have some room for for some leakage or for some fraud to to be happening. You know, obviously this is I think why why the Oracle space is is so interesting and why we have so much collective investment as as a web3 movement in in better oracles and better ways to get data on chain but there is always going to be space you know that some misinformation or some falsehood can can get in i think where where we look to measure the metric of success and where we think blockchain can really bring us a long way is is just in reducing the amount of time it takes or the amount of frauds that a single bad actor can commit before mm -hmm. being caught. And gotcha. so it's, you know, it's a question of, hey, can we can we get consumers, can we get end buyers to question these things, to look at these things? Can we make it so that it's a competitive marketplace? So, you know, competitors are actually incentivized to be looking out to see if anyone else is committing fraud, because, well, if you and I are both trying to sell the same thing and you're doing it fraudulently or I'm doing it fraudulently, you know, the one of us that's acting honestly is, is going to want to call attention to that, right? Because we're, we're competitive with each other. And so if I think in a lot of ways, by bringing consumers, by bringing end buyers closer into the process, by creating more, you know, more robust and competitive markets, and also just making the data, the underlying data and the underlying information uh, more freely accessible and more open via you know, decentralized file storage or, you know, permissionless setups in general, which is really going to to be able to maybe by a factor of 10, hopefully by a factor of 100, reduce the time that it takes to to catch this fraud and therefore, you know, really cut that, uh, you know, cut that by a factor of 90%, 99%, hopefully even higher. I'll end on a little bit about the future and, and kind of if you look out, you know, three to five years, let's say, what are some of the successes or or goals that you and the team hope to hope to reach as a as a company as a, as a protocol as 
you know, a, a place in sort of the impact space, I guess, what are some of the successes that you hope to, to reach? Yeah, absolutely. So, so the first thing that I'll actually say, and it's, you know, it's, it's a goal for this year, or it's a goal for the, these first 18, 18 months of that, but it's really to actually stop being a company in the way that we are one today. So, so Topol has always taken a bit of a different path to our development in that even though we are developing and have always had our sights set on becoming a permissionless blockchain, we've been a fairly traditional venture-backed company. Mm -hmm. To date, all that's changing this year. We have our decentralization and our, our TGE, our token generation event slated for the end of the year. You know, we'll be transitioning over to, to token-based governance, looking at launching a DAO, all those, you know, all those really exciting things. So the first item on the list is to grow beyond just being, you know, kind of this little company that we are now and really start to answer the question of how can we be more of a community? How can we be more of, of a movement? Um, that's, you know, I think that's one big goal that we are making a lot of strides towards. One of the other goals for us, and, and you alluded to this a little bit, is we really want to be to be a part of, and we're incredibly excited by copying the successes that have, you know, that have happened in the carbon space, right? We now think of carbon as something that you can invest in, that you can buy and sell, that you can create financial instruments around. We're doing a lot of work to try to expand that to to other areas of impact, actually other even other areas of impact beyond just, you know, nature-based credits. We have, you know, we have a cohort of about 10 different NGOs, social enterprises, multilaterals right now that we're working with to create a more general vision of, of impact credits. We have some groups huh. that are working on peace. We have some groups that are working on sanitation. We have some groups that are working on gender equity. And we're all trying to answer the question together. Interesting. Yeah. How can we tokenize these other forms of impact? And, you know, kind of, you know, we, we kind of spent a lot of time bashing on the carbon space and talking about how it can do better. But, you know, the simple reality that it's managed to create a market is something that I think a lot of the rest of the impact and development space is looking uh, to replicate. And we want to be a part of that. I love that. That's super interesting. Well, thank you so much for taking the time, Chris. It's been an amazing conversation. Uh, I've learned a ton. I really appreciate you know you and you and the the team, the work that has been put in so far. I know it's incredibly difficult to even get to this point, you know. So uh, <laughs> keep up, keep up the grind every day, my man. And uh, best best of luck for you and the team for the next decade. Awesome. Grant, really appreciate that. Really appreciate um, you having me on today. And next time you're in Austin, let me know and we can meet up. Absolutely.